So we are happy to have Victor Gabrielon uh, to give the last talk today. Uh, Victor was a PhD in INRIA and was a postdoc in Queensland University of Technology. And he's currently in the industry. Uh, his work covers a wide range of, uh, wide range of topics in bandits and reinforcement learning. Specifically, he works, uh, has done several works in based on identification, pure exploration, or main name X bond for expert problem. And he also have several, uh, has a lot of uh, empirical project in the in industry. And today he will be talking about based on identification and best of both world. Thank you. Uh, everybody, thank you, Chen Yu, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizer for organizing the workshop and having me. So I'm presenting a joint work with uh, Yassine abassiat kori Peter Bartlett, Alan Malek, and uh, Michel Valco. And I'm going to start with a slide that summarizes the talk and, uh, the, and the work. So we are going to talk about um, bandit problem, which is a best arm identification problem, because the goal will be to identify the best arm. So it's different from the bandit problem you had in the pre previous talk. I will try to explain that. But as in the previous talk, what we are interested in is asking this best of both world type of question. So it means we're we'll trying to have a learner that is able to work in a setting where the data is generated stochastically, or if actually the data is designed to make it fail. And we wanted to perform in a stochastic setting as if he knew in advance that he was in a stochastic setting, and we want to work it uh, we want it to work in the adversarial se setting as if he knew it was against an adversary. So we saw in the previous talk that it was possible to do it in a classical bandit problem. Can you do it in the best arm identification problem? That's what we are going to look at. And the way we'll go about it is going through uh, the state of the art for the stochastic setting. Then we we'll look at what does it change when you face an adversary. This will lead us basically to ask the best of both worlds question. Can we, can we achieve it? We will have a first impossibility result. So actually in this setting, you cannot do it, but we will reformulate the question and we'll basically design an algorithm that match uh, the lower bound of the impossibility result. So what is the best arm identification problem? We formulate it here uh, in a fixed budget setting. So you have an exploration phase of fixed length um, of basically there will be big T rounds and the learner will try to identify the best arm. So the, the arm which will accumulate the most uh, reward over the T rounds. And I insist that, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a bandit feedback. So the learner only observes the reward and the gain of the arm that he has choose to explore. And this is basically the protocol. So it goes for T rounds, big T rounds. And at each round, simultaneously, we are, you have a learner that picks an arm uh, denoted it here between one and k. Uh, then the reward is generated uh, by a process. It can be adversarial or stochastic environment. Basically, it picks a vector of size k, the number of experts, which tells the reward of each expert. And the learner only observes one component of that vector, gt, gitt. And finally, at the end of uh, this phase, this exploration phase, the learner has to recommend an arm which he thinks is the best one. The way we don't need denote that is this, with this big one uh, indexed by T. Sometimes we we'll drop the dependency in big T in, um, in a purple box. Uh, and so that's his recommendation. And he hopes that he's actually making the, the good recommendation. So he's actually recommending the ground truth best arm, which we denote in green. So purple will be the point of view of the algorithm, and green will be the ground truth. And the, the ground truth here. How we define the best arm is the arm that, in hindsight, has been allocated the most reward. And so the cumulative reward is big GKT, and it's basically the sum of the GKT for that particular arm. OK, here I'm just introducing a simple notation uh, about ranking. Uh, so you have, let's say you have an, a bounded problem with four arms. And at the end of the game, they have been allocated cumulatively those rewards. And then we basically sort them by, from the one which has the most reward so our best arm to the worst. So here we have like index three is ranked one. And just the notation is that if you give me a rank K, uh, this thing tells you which uh, bandit is ranked K according to the ground truth um, 
reward. And the opposite is uh, basically, if you give me an arm, I can tell you whoops, which rank it has with the diamond notation. And if we change color, this is from the point of view of the learner. So it's with an estimate of the, um, of the true reward. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, kind of repeat what I said, but just illust uh, illustrate it graphically so that it will help us uh, discuss later uh, the problem. So we start with a bandit problem. Let here we have just four arms. I mean, it could be uh, in terms of application, different product that you want to test. You will have a fixed um, exploration. I mean, fixed number of tests, t test, and at the end maybe you want to decide which one which one you put in the market. Uh, it could be drugs that you test uh, over t patient, and then at the end you want to see which one cure the best some disease. It could be potentially even some experts that maybe each day they give you an advice on how to run your business. And then you try to maybe hire the one that gives you the best advices over that test period. Uh, so yeah, graphically, yeah, at every time step, we have a vector that is generated of reward. The, the learner will pick an arm here, this one, and only get to see this reward. And basically, it doesn't see the rest. Time to the same. And then after t time, you have defined basically a big matrix where the learner has only seen part of it and most of it has been not seen. And okay, we denote this matrix G. And uh, here basically is the cumulative reward that helps us define what is the best arm. So it's basically the sum of the column. Uh, in that particular case, uh, to be sure we understand the notation, um, here it would make sense for the learner to basically recommend the, the expert with a white background. But in that particular case, it would be a mistake. The expert with a little will is actually the best. If we, if you look at, if you sum all the rewards that have been seen or not seen. Okay. Now I want to make a difference between our setting, the best R identification setting, and the classical bandit setting. So the classical bandit setting would use the cumulative regret, and for us, we used as a measure of performance the probability of error. We try to minimize the probability of error, the, minimize the probability of misidentifying the best arm. So our goal is to identify the best arm. And while in the cumulative regret setting, the goal is to play the best arm most of the time. So you, you basically are penalized. If you play a suboptimal arm, you are penalized. While in our case, we are free totally to explore. In our case, it's what we call pure exploration. And in the classical bandit case, you have this exploration exploitation trade-off. Okay, so we are going to look at this best arm identification um, problem under different assumptions over the reward. And this best arm identification problem has been already studied in some of um, these cases. So for example, there has been a lot of study in the stochastic cases uh, where the GKT is sampled IID uh, from some unknown mean, and uh, for, sorry, from some unknown distribution that has some unknown mean in UK. Um, we'll actually look at uh, related work because we will base our research on that for the Anderson case. And then people have been interested in looking at a non-stochastic case, basically drop the IID um, assumption and non stochastic assumption because it makes sense in practice to make algorithm more robust. And actually what we are going to look at in this um, talk is the extreme case where this matrix G can be totally arbitrary and in a worst case analysis can be designed to make the learner totally fail, to make the probability of error as big as possible. And this formulation has not been looked at uh, in the best time identification problem, but it's pretty similar to the way it's formulated uh, in the classical adversarial bandit. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some related work in the non-stochastic setting. So yeah, so non-stochastic. We have actually uh, an interesting work by uh, Kevin Jamison, um, which was tailored to uh, hyperparameter optimization. So the GKT in their case uh, were non-stochastic, but with the condition that they would converge to um, a fixed value uh, as time goes to infinity. And also I want to mention that the way they would gather the data is different from us. And maybe it's interesting to look at this to understand better our setting. So this would be our setting, this would be the, or the other setting. In our setting, at time t, what do we see? Uh, it's the pink stars. So if I, I decide at time t to 
get some value from the expert with a tie, I would basically see this value. And there is no hope that, I mean, this time goes like this. So there is no hope that those values, I will ever see them. They are hidden for me forever. Uh, in their case, uh, it was making sense to assume that if I pull the tie expert, you would get to see the next one in the pile. Um, also, I want to mention another algorithm that is doing best, best term identification in non-stochastic case. Uh, so we have things that are totally non-stationary there, but they have um, an assumption in that, uh, in the paper by Alessia Do, Ferro, and Maillard, which is that the best arm, uh, the identity of the best arm doesn't change through time. It has to be the same over all the experiments. And actually, from our point, from our point of view, it actually removes some of the hard case that we use in our, in our lower bound. So it, it removes some hard cases. Okay. So... Now let's go and talk about the state of the art in the stochastic setting that we will use to build our algorithm in the adversarial setting. So what are the basic things you can do? The most basic thing you can do is to explore totally uniformly. So you have a budget T and you divide it equally between the arms, T over K. But okay, that's not the smartest thing. I mean, you can do something smarter because intuitively, once you start to pull some arms, some of them are clearly suboptimal, and you start to say, okay, I could save some budget, stop pulling that arm, and pull more uh, other arms that I'm not sure about if they are the best, and to focus on the best arm. So I'm going to talk about a tiny bit more about successive reject in the next slide. But uh, before I want to mention that all those algorithms, classically, they are based on an estimate of the mean, uh, mu hat uh, kt, which is the simple average. I mean, just summing the, the reward that you have seen divided by the number of rewards that you have seen. And this will uh, actually be biased when we go to an adversary. Um, and also, I want to introduce uh, a table that I will try to populate throughout the talk. So, so far, there is not much. We just said that we had two algorithms here. Uh, and we have only talked about the stochastic setting. And we say that uniform is not very good, successive is better. And we have not talked about yeah, the adversarial case. And okay, I will try to make this table uh, grow. Uh, but as I said first, I'm going to say explain what is successive reject because basically our final solution will be an extension of it. So successive reject is an elimination algorithm. You start with uh, four experts and you just play them uniformly for a first phase. And then you look at their expected mean and you reject an arm here. Let's say it's the tie expert. So now you reject, you stop pulling it. Then, uh, so, and the, yeah, you reject it and then you pull uniformly the three remaining arms. At the end of phase two, you reject an, another arm. So here is this one, and you continue pulling the two last one, and then at the end, you make a recommendation. The important thing in successive reject is how long are those phases. And the intuition is that it, is that it works because it does the following thing it tries to pull the arm that is uh, ranked K with an estimated rank K. Uh, it tries to give it a number of pool which is inversely proportional to its estimated long. So it, it has T over K. Basically, uh, the estimated best arm has almost T pool. The estimated second best arm has almost half of all the pools. The estimated third best arm, a third. And this has nice property because, I mean, in some sense, you pull everybody almost uniformly. You play the two best arm uh, as if the rest of the arm did not exist, and you play almost the best arm almost all the time. So this is something that we will basically reuse uh, in later slide. But okay, so right now I'm, I'm still in the stochastic setting and uh, I explained the algorithm, but I haven't given the, the like some theoretical results. What are the, actually the probability of error? And so we want to characterize the probability of error to be able later to compare stochastic uh, setting with adversarial setting. So let's look at how you analyze those algorithms. Uh, basically, in a stochastic setting, you need to define uh, some kind of notion of complexities. And uh, let's start with a simple example. If you have two arms that I want to discriminate, this, this is the final cumulative reward they have. Uh, of course, there will be noise, so you, are, you will have some no noisy estimate, and you might make some mistake. But the more you, you get pulled, the more your estimate go to the mean. And if you use a chernoff of dim type of result, uh, you can, you, you, what will happen in the analysis is that it will tell you that the number of, I mean, the number of pools somehow that you need to use so that you are able to discriminate those two harm with high priority depends on this complexity H, which is 
one over the gap square. And the gap square, I mean, the gap is just the difference between them. So the smaller the gap, the harder it is to discriminate them. So this was for two arms. Now, if you have k arms, what you expect to have is just the sum over the inverse gap squared. And that's almost uh, what you're going to have. Uh, because basically, the, uh, the, the intuition in the stochastic case, um, and which will not be true actually against an adversary, is that to discriminate the best arm uh, from the fourth best arm, you need to have confidence interval around their value, which is smaller than half the gap, so that the confidence interval do not overlap. Okay, and so what do we actually get? Uh, this is the complexity that we get for the uniform algorithm. It's not the sum of the inverse gap squared because uniform is not a good algorithm. It's k times uh, the minimal gap and successive reject gets something which is actually close, very close to the sum of the inverse gap squared up to some log k factor. And the way it looks is this like um, max of the index divided by the uh, corresponding gap squared. Okay, so where are we right now? We just uh, finished talking about the stochastic setting and we have that the probability of error there decrease, decrease actually exponentially, um, so exponential minus t over the complexity. So the bigger the complexity, the bigger the error. Um, and we have that the state of the art is to have this complexity h of sr in the stochastic setting. But so now, what can we do against an adversary? Let's just like, take the vanilla successive reject and throw it against an adversary and see how it works. Uh, basically, it will fail uh, because the adversary is just powerful. He can arrange any um, matrix G of reward. So here I have an example of successive reject against an adversary. Uh, successive reject, if it's the vanilla version and it plays totally de deterministically, the adversary knows that you're not going to see that value. He can just put it to an arbitrary value and confuse you. Second thing is that you have those um, elimination phases. You reject an arm forever, and this is bad against an adversary. Because, for example, this Thai expert, you, you are basically saying that I totally ignore all the rewards that are here. And the way we define our problem is that we want to find the expert that has the highest cumulated uh, rewards. So we, we count everything. And in an adversarial setting, there is no reason why this thing would be related to that. So you will be super biased. And basically, in general, using um, the, this estimation of the mean, the standard one, would be biased against an adversary. So the takeaway is that probably you need internal randomization, not reject, and use probably something with smaller bias. Um, at least that's what we do. OK. So now where are we? We have two algorithms that work in a stochastic case and that fail against an adversary. So then the question is like, okay, can, what can we do against an adversary? Uh, so the first idea that you want to test is let's take the uniform algorithm, the uniform allocation exploration algorithm, and let's just robustify it a little bit and see how it works. Um, so basically we use internal randomization. We introduce now a probability of pulling arm it at time, uh, sorry, uh, pu pulling arm k at time t. And in the, for a uniform algorithm, it's simply one over k. And the second thing we do is we replace uh, the estimation of the mean by uh, the importance weight uh, estimation of the mean, where now when you see a reward, you divide it by the probability that you would see that reward. So the good thing is that it's unbiased. The bad thing for the next of the talk is that it actually increased the variance because if this p is small, this quantity is large and it will have a high variance. But so far for our robust uh, uniform learner, uh, we, we don't care, let's say. So this is just the algorithm. And so how does it work against uh, an adversary? Uh, you can simply, it's a simple proof to show that actually the uniform allocation against an adversary is as good as if it was against um, uh, in a stochastic case. Again, you have probability um, of error that diminish exponentially fast with H unif appearing. Okay, but okay, uniform is the baseline. We know it's not that smart. Can we do better? Actually, the thing is that in general, you can't. Against uh, an adversary with a worst case scenario, you just cannot uh, do better than uniform. It's a pretty sad result. It kind of means that the problem is so hard that um, just doing the basic thing is not improvable. But it's not the end of the story. 
Uh, we'll talk about that later, actually. Uh, but first, yeah, yeah. First, let's look at a sketch of proof and how this, like, somehow the adversary has more power, so now it can confuse quite a lot uh, the learner. Basically, uh, the arguments that we use are based on a classical argument in the in the literature. Uh, the thing that is that we have a new construction here. And we have a new construction because now we are dealing with, a, I mean, compared to the stochastic case, because we have an adversary and he has much more power. And what will happen is that the adversary somehow now, it can force the learner to have an uncertainty around its mean of all the arms of order delta one and not delta k. Previously, I said, oh, to discriminate arm k from the best arm, you needed to have an uncertainty of order uh, delta k. Now, actually, for all the arms, you need delta one. Uh, which is much smaller and it makes the print too hard, I mean, too hard, harder. What is actually the construction? Uh, so give, basically give me any learner, give me any bounded problem that we define only for the first half of the game. And then I will say, okay, that learner playing that particular problem will play an arm, not a lot. Uh, let's say for this, uh, let's say that here, um, let's fix that it's uh, the, the, the worst arm. I mean, that's kind of what, should happen. Uh, so the, the expert with the will. And basically, you can say that he will play it less than t over 2k time. Uh, and so basically, because the learner doesn't pull this arm a lot, we can use that to trick him. And how do we trick him? We create a second problem, which is pretty similar. The only difference here is that um, this expert now has just a value that is being increased by just delta one if we superpose the two problems. And the problem is that those, uh, the, the problem for the learner is that those two problems are in, quite indistinguishable from the point of view of the learner. Basically, when he will see observation playing the game, it will be hard to say for him if he's facing that problem or that problem. And at first, it, it, could, it, it looked like it doesn't really matter because this is not the best arm. So why would I care about that arm? Actually, because it's an adversarial setting, now uh, we can define those problems for the second half of the game. And in, if in the second half of the game, I just deterministically change the value of that arm and make it in one of the problems, the best one, and, uh, and, the, and the other problem, the second best one. Now I have two problems that look very similar and where in one, you should recommend uh, the bandit with a wheel and the other one, you should recommend the bandit with uh, the glasses. Uh, the, yeah, sorry, the, the arm with the wheel and the arm or the arm with the, the glasses. Uh, so then the, the lower bound comes from that. Like you, we have two problems and it will, from the point of view of the learner, it will be hard to know in which problem he is, but he has to make a decision and he has to choose between the expert with glasses and the expert with a wheel. Uh, basically, the, the, the right argument is to use a um, change of measure and consider the event uh, when you should like of recommending the uh, woman with glasses. And basically because problem one and problem two are very close to each other, the probability of those two are related with the relation being that, being how close they are. And you know that in this world, that's what you should do. You should recommend the, the woman with uh, glasses as an expert. And so this thing needs to be super close to one. Otherwise, it's bad. And so, because it's super close to one, because it's super close to one, then you have a lower bound on the error you do on the second problem. So that's how you get the lower bound. And as I said, like I mean, it's sad uh, in the adver in the adversarial case, in the worst case, you cannot do better than uniform. But it's not the end of the story because right now, what is happening? We have an algorithm that works well in the stochastic setting but fails. In, uh, against an adversary in this vanilla version. And we have something uniform that we know is uh, not uh, that good in a stochastic setting, but it works very good against an adversary. So naturally, then you want to ask uh, the best of both world question. Can you have an algorithm that basically get those two rates at the, sorry, those two rates, like they are here, let's say, those two rates at the same time being optimal in both while not knowing if, it's, if the environment will be stochastic or adversarial. Um, and we have been inspired uh, basically by a lot of work in the classical bandit case where, which has been studying that question. In, in their case, they could achieve the best of both worlds, uh, as you have seen. Uh, so what can we do in our case? Actually, in our case, we cannot. 
Uh, we cannot achieve the, those two rates at the same time. And to understand that, we need to introduce a new notion. This notion is here, HBOB, um, for best of both worlds. You see that this uh, notion, of, oh yeah, this notion of complexity is defined for the stochastic case, not for the adversarial case, for the stochastic case. Uh, you see that the, the way it's formulated, it has it borrows some uh, some of the complexity from SR and from some of the complexity for HUNIF. And let's look at the let's look actually at the lower bound. The lower bound is saying that if there is an algorithm that claims that it can solve all the uh, bounded problem against an adversary. Actually, here it's even weaker than that. We just ask we, if it just claims that its probability of error is one, smaller than one over sixteen. I mean, in the end, we want to have something that actually vanishes to zero. But just if it claims it can do better than one over sixteen for all the adversarial problem, then you can build a stochastic problem where the probability of error will be bigger than, uh, than something where H Bob will appear. And the problem with that is that H Bob in some cases is H of SR times square root of K. So you have something, it's worsening by square root of K in the worst case. So you cannot have the best of both worlds. Is it the end of the story? And, well, not yet, we can still do something, but we'll talk about that uh, a tiny bit later. First, I'm going to uh, give an idea of how the adversary can trick the learner to get this lower bound. Uh, so what is the construction there? Here, uh, we said in a stochastic setting, you need to have an uncertainty over delta k over all your arm. Here, it's still the same. An adversary will force you to have an, an uncertainty of, 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 of order delta k between all your arms, but he will force you to have that earlier in the game. Before, you had to do that to have that at the end of the game at time t. Here, the adversary forces you to have that amount, that uh, amount of uncertainty at time t delta 1 over delta k. And this is smaller than 1 because delta 1 is the smallest. Uh, gap. Why? Why is that? Let's look at the construction. So we start with basically any bandit problem. And this bandit problem will be actually how the adversary will attack the learner. So give me a learner. Give me actually any rank k, which um, arm. And we have this problem that we define only for between the start of the game until this T over delta one delta k. So that's the length of the attack. And let's look at how the learner play this uh, problem. Again, we identify an arm that is not played enough and we will try to fool the learner uh, by modifying this arm. So we will say that there is at least one arm called k prime among the best k arms that is pulled at least T over k delta one delta k. Uh, and here we illustrate that taking a, an example where I choose, I choose um, arbitrarily that k will be equal to four, so it's the worst arm. And let's say that here the learner, the, the, the arm that is not pulling that much is actually also the worst arm. Actually, if it was any other arm, it would mean that the learner is even less smart. Like if he was not pulling the best arm most of the time, it would be even the worst case for him. So let's even imagine that the learner is smart. He is pulling the, the worst arm, the, the less. Still, we can trick him. So the worst arm right now is, a, is the wheel expert. And so how can we trick? From the attack, I'm defining now the, actually the stochastic uh, problem. In the stochastic problem, now the wheel expert is the best arm. So this problem is, uh, yeah, this problem is defined from time one to time t. And now, now I have my stochastic problem. How do I define uh, my adversary? My adversary will first do the attack and then pretend is the stochastic problem. So first he will do, like all the arms do not change. Yeah. Only the, the only change is here. Uh, so for a short attack, the adversary will uh, pretend that, uh, I mean, will give rewards of that magnitude. And then at the end of the attack, he will just come back to this one and pretend it's the stochastic setting for most of the time. So it will be hard to distinguish it with the stochastic setting. And he does that so that at the end, in hindsight, when uh, the exploration phase is finished, his total cumulative reward is this one. So compared to the, um, the stochastic <coughs> setting, we have managed to decrease the, the value of that arm because of the attack of order delta one. 
So the, the attack is of, our, is of magnitude delta, delta K, I mean, delta four here, and it's short enough so that we have changed the value of this arm by delta one. And basically now we have two problems again, where the identity of the best arm is different. So two problems that look very similar, actually the probability of confusion here is exponential minus T delta one delta K, which looks like the H bob that we have at the end because there is delta one and delta K. And this comes from the fact that, I mean, our attack is of magnitude uh, delta K and the time it lasts is T delta one delta K. And that's basically how it confused. Um, uh, yeah, no, basically you take um, maximum over K and you get uh, your lower bound. So what is our result is that it's impossible to get the best of both worlds because we get, you have to be at least as worst uh, as h -bob in the in the stochastic setting. So is it the end of the story? No. H bob sometimes is, is bad compared to HSR, but it's not that bad all the time. So basically, H bob is in between H of SR and H unif. You can see that even like just looking at the equation, because it kind of borrows part of HSR and H unif. It has the one over minimal gap and the max of one k divided by delta k. It just doesn't have the squares. And if we look at how H bob uh, varies between HSR and H unif, you can look at specific cases. In the flat regime, where you have just this is like the how the arms are good. So in the flat regime, when you have just one good arms and all the other arms are the same. I mean, actually, in this case, all those quantities are the same. We just need to play uniformly in this case. Um, if the landscape of the means is uh, linear, then actually you can achieve the best of both worlds because each of us are is the same as H pop, but definitely playing uniform there would be would not be smart. Um, and the interesting, interesting case is the square root regime uh, with its landscape of uh, that looks like a square root. There, H bob is exactly in the middle. That's where we have a lower bound. It's because H bob is square root k worse than H SR, but it's better than H unif. So, because H bob is better than H unif, I mean, it means we still don't have an algorithm that uh, can achieve uh, the lower bound that we have in our impossibility result. So now we can reformulate the best of both world problem by asking, can we have an algorithm that reach now those rates, H bob and H unif, I mean H bob in a stochastic case and H unif against an adversary. So then the remaining challenge is, uh, how do we define this algorithm? What type of estimator do we use? You could try to use the, the biased one or the unbiased one, but with high variance. We go for the one which is unbiased, uh, but with high variance. And this problem of variance is quite uh, significant and comes very fast actually, because we said the variance come from the fact that we divide by PKT. And PKT, if it's small, this thing is big and uh, gives us big variance. So actually, when I say big, if it's one over K, it's big. And one over K is what you do when you pull uniformly. And uniformly is the thing you have to do at the beginning of the game. When you have no information, you have to pull uniformly. So you will incur at the beginning uh, uh, variance of order k. But if you manage to stop pulling those arms, the, the best arm with uh, probability one over k, and you start to pull them more often, your final total variance will be um, will be not of order one over k. So uh, of order k. So what you need to do is contain this uncertainty, contain this variance by starting to pull the best arm early because the best arm are the ones on which you want to have small uncertainty, small variance. You need basically to do early bets. Start to say, start, yeah, start to pull the best arm earlier. But I mean, somehow it's hard because it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Like the, your goal is to find the best arm. And I'm telling you that if you want to find the best arm, you need to pull the best arm more. So there is a race. Um, and so what algorithm are we going to, to test? Basically, we take successive reject and we do two things. We, do, we robustify it and we do those early bets. Um, so to robustify it, we basically use the unbiased estimator. We make sure that we don't pull uniformly things like successive reject, which pulls basically all the arms for half of the time almost uh, uniformly by making some early bets, as you will see. Uh, we remove the rejection, no rejection, but we use we the core idea, which is to pull 
every arm inversely proportional to the estimated rank. So what does the algorithm look like? It's very simple. Uh, the same thing at every time step. You try to pull the estimated best arm with probability one, the estimated second best arm with probability one half, third best one with probability one third, and so on. And the worst arm is, for, is, is pulled with probability one over k. And OK, it doesn't sum up to one, so we normalize. And this is just a log k, because the sum of uh, the one over k is log k. And so again, we have this nice property that most of the time we play the best arm, the two best arms are played as if the rest were not existing. And it's kind of everybody's pulled almost uniformly. Uh, and the cost is just a log k. And we have the fact that we are doing early bets. The thing is that even at time t equal two, we start to pull the estimated best arm almost all the time. So we have those early bets, and it actually uh, basically uh, will work. Um, this is, again, the algorithm. It's just a two-line algorithm. Uh, just uh, ranking the arms according to the unbiased estimator, pulling inversionally, inversionally proportional to the, frequent, to the uh, rank, estimated rank, and then at the end, recommending the arm that has the highest unbiased estimator. And this is an algorithm which is actually any time and parameter free. It doesn't even, yeah, yeah basically parameter free. And just a fun fact is that um, actually this distribution, which is to allocate things one over uh, their rank of uh, one over their rank, has actually some a name. And um, oops. Uh, it doesn't appear on this slide, but it, but okay, it has a name which is Zimf for this uh, distribution, and you actually see it. Um, when you look at the frequency of words in the English dictionary, uh, basically the word that you see the most is the in the English dictionary, and it's frequent, twice as much frequent than the second word that you see the most, which is off, three times as much as the third word, which is and, and so on. Okay. And so if we analyze uh, this algorithm, P1, we actually get the best of both worlds up to uh, log k factors. So we get H Bob in a stochastic setting. We get H unif against an adversary, and um, that's basically, yeah. Uh, that's kind of kind of conclude our, our search. We can um, uh, start to look a bit at the proof. I mean, actually, the proof of this algorithm there is very easy against an adversary because we pull things uniformly, and that's all it's needed against an adversary. But in a stochastic setting, you need to be able to um, make sure that the variance is very small. So the way you will analyze this algorithm is by creating some um, virtual phases. This actually phases doesn't, do not exist in the algorithm. The algorithm has no phases, it's just here uh, for the analysis. And so what you want is that at time T1, which is uh, parameters by A1, you want this event, the event I to be true. And you want it to be true very fast and you want it to be true with very high priority. So this event is good, it's, it's just saying that you basically rank, rank well all the, uh, arms, the, the arms that are supposed to be the, from one to the i best, the if, the if best arm are supposed to be ranked among the if best. And this is something we want because it means that from now on, if, uh, when this event starts to be true, it means that now the probability that you pull them start to be big. And now you know that you don't incur any more big variance after uh, this event. Is true, but in when you do the analysis, then there is actually like um, a trade-off. I mean, there is an optimal va value for a one because we both want this event to be true uh, very early, but with, to be true with high priority. And if you do the analysis, you end up with this complexity in the probability of error, which depends on the length of your phase. And the one that seems to be good is to take a i. I mean, to take the t i so that. Uh, of this quantity. And this quantity is the quantity that we had also in the lower bound, which was the length of the attack. So the length of the attack is also the length of the, uh, before the event are true, actually. And so if you plug that there, you get back uh, H Bob uh, up to some log K factors. Uh, and basically my last slide, uh, you can now uh, test in the stochastic setting uh, P1 to see if it works according to the, what was forecasted by the theory. 
Uh, basically, you don't expect P1, so P1 here is in yellow. You don't expect it to be better than successive reject. It should be in between. Uh, and we basically want to know if it kind of corresponds to the, the probability of error matches the, the complexity that you can compute on those problem. And let's say, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail, but let's say it globally does. I mean, not always you have good counter example in the uniform case, but like in the case where HBOB is achievable, it is achieved. And in the case where uh, the, the hardest case for um, what we talked about, the square root experiment is actually also the one where um, the, the ratio between the probability of error of those two is actually the biggest. And uh, that's it basically. Uh, can you actually use sequential heavy instead of successive rejects to do the exactly same thing? Because sequential heavy is actually more like a state of the art algorithm compared to successive rejects for fixed budget based on identification. Right? I mean, definitely, you should never reject permanently now. But uh, so rejecting is, is bad. But maybe you could reuse the proportion. That are in sequential having, yes. which are very close to the ones that are here. Maybe we improve a tiny bit the bound. Actually, we don't need to look at it. Uh, but um, like at the level of precision that I have, uh, maybe we might improve the locate, I'm not even sure. Um, but yeah, basically, with that algorithm, we already match H code. So the only thing that is left to improve is the, the locate. So, so you, you made the distinction in the when you discussed the non stochastic best identification from the literature, but essentially you see the next uh, essentially all the draws are pre decided and you see them sequentially rather than rather than uh, essentially only seeing one and never seeing. You have this figure with the, the blue and the red, I guess. It's kind of early. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right this there. is our setting where let's say this is tiny t, and this is the pink thing I would think that I would see. Can you discuss why we have this difference between the two settings? Like, I guess, like, my understanding is that the left hand side is uh, the previous setting, right? Uh, yeah, it's the yeah, answer in the paper of uh, Kevin. Okay. And I guess. Uh, I think it was making sense in their application that uh, in the application they could see everything. It's just that the, those values would be totally, you know, they could be as much stochastic, but they would converge to, uh, to some fixed value at the end. I see something. Yeah, yeah. I guess. So what is exactly so in that setting you see what? And in that setting you see the next one in the pile. So in some sense, nothing will be even for And if everything is adversarial, can they just put very bad things happening in the end and you will never decide them like them? Yeah, but this will not can be not that much bad because things need to convert at some point. I see. So, so regarding this discussion, if you forget about this condition that we converge, uh, is there a difference, a provable difference between having the two settings? Uh, so, so. Is there a provable difference in the habits of two settings, um, even if you don't assume that things converge? And yeah, probably maybe if things don't converge somehow now, maybe the hidden value is. Yeah, uh, so right you can change whatever the hidden value was. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So in the case, maybe these other settings have the same. Yeah, I agree. Probably, if you remove that assumption, then the two settings will be the same. <laughs> Thank you.
So let's thank her again. And thank, thank you all for the partic participation today.